on PM, so I think we can go ahead and um, start. Um, so this is the Integrating Drupal 8 um, with Salesforce session and um, my name is Sarat Tipaluru and I work for um, a firm New Target based off of the DC area here. Um, New Target basically does web design, development, uh, SEO, marketing, all different kinds of integrations as you can see here since we're talking about integrating with Salesforce but we do integrate with all different kinds of um, AMSs, um, Netform, Personify, um, Paralogic, any kind of uh, AMS. Um, how many of you here are actually using Salesforce? Part of my office is, I don't Okay. Um, so we'll talk here about uh, integrating Drupal 8 um, with Salesforce. As many of you might have heard or might not have heard, Salesforce is one of, um, one of the leading um, CRMs out there and they do have various products basically like Sales Cloud, Service Cloud and many other platforms. For the sake of this session, I'm going to take the sales cloud as an example. Um, I'll just, I just have like a, a sandbox, a Salesforce organization created with some uh, dummy records in there. So what I'll go ahead and do in this session is uh, I'll talk about how do we um, establish a connection between Drupal and Salesforce. So there's communication between Drupal and Salesforce um, and also how to pull information from Salesforce into Drupal and also update information in Drupal and then make sure that information is getting pushed back um, to Salesforce as well. And I'll show you a couple of um, things that you could do, you could configure and things that I've learned uh, during my experience with integrating um, with Salesforce. So I'm going to go ahead um, into the demo here. Um, so I basically have like a plain uh, Drupal 8 site here, nothing fancy, I've just installed modules that I need. Uh, for this presentation and the main module that I've installed is the Drupal 8 um, Salesforce Suite module. So it's a contributed module that you can just download and install like any other module that you would download and install. And once you install that, it gives you a suite of sub-modules that you're going to need if you want to exchange information between Drupal and Salesforce. So I have the module already installed here, um, but I'll still go ahead uh, into the module listing page and show you what those modules are. So the modules I have enabled here are um, the Salesforce integration, which obviously you would need to integrate with Salesforce, uh, the Salesforce mapping, so that you can map uh, different entities within Drupal to different objects in Salesforce. Um, the Salesforce pull, as the name itself suggests, is for pulling information from Salesforce into your Drupal 8 website, and Salesforce push is basically the module that you would need uh, to push information from Drupal um, to Salesforce. So these are the modules that I have enabled, but if you need anything else, uh, there are other contributed modules too that are available that you could download and install um, as per um, needed. Um, so after you have enabled the modules, the first thing you would need is basically establish a connection between the Drupal 8 site and um, your Salesforce instance so that there can be communication between both. Uh, to do that, what you would need to do is, um, so I have here um, a Salesforce uh, developer organization uh, in Salesforce, all of these instances are called organizations. That's why I keep using the term organization. Um, so I have the Salesforce developer account that I created. With that, you basically have all this um, dummy sample data in there. So all you would need is basically create a Salesforce uh, developer account. Uh, and then once you log in, you'll kind of end up with this interface where you see all these different, uh, let's call them links. Uh, for now, leads, accounts, contacts, opportunities, for guests. Uh, and I'm assuming most of you here have Drupal knowledge because you're here at the Drupal GovCon. Um, so in Drupal, just like we have content types, in Salesforce, the related term would be objects. So just like how content types in Drupal basically have all these fields uh, to enter information, to store information, in Salesforce, they're called objects. Uh, and then just like you have nodes in Drupal that belong to a content type, for example, you can have 100 different nodes that belong to one content type in Drupal, 200 different nodes that belong to other content type in Drupal, you would have um, records in Salesforce. So a node is kind of equivalent to record in Salesforce, content type is kind of <coughs> equivalent to object in um, Salesforce. So once you have the modules installed in Drupal, and once you have a Salesforce developer account, um, what you would do is basically, um, you would go to your, um, let's call it the home page. And it kind of has um, like a dashboard um, where you can see basically all the information. But to establish the connection, you would go to um, setup. So I clicked the setup link in the top right. And in the center section here for quick links, there's something called manage apps. 
So you would go to manage apps and what you would need to do is you would need to basically create a connected app because you're trying to establish a connection between your Salesforce organization and another platform, the other platform here being uh, Drupal 8. So you would go ahead and create uh, a connected app. I have already created one here, but I'll just go ahead and show you how to create another one. Uh, but I'll still use the already existing connection. So if I click new, it will basically just ask you for uh, creating a name. Um, and then if I say um, just integration, um, just like Drupal has a machine name, um, which is very critical from a Drupal standpoint, Salesforce has something called an API name. That's kind of our machine name uh, in Drupal terms. So just like how Drupal automatically fills in the machine name whenever you create a field or a client and type, Salesforce automatically fills in the API name, so you don't have to worry about that. And then this contact email and phone number is basically just like when you're setting up the site administrator email. Uh, in Drupal, you would just give an email here and phone number here. Uh, you would enable OAuth settings basically um, because you need uh, OAuth between your um, Drupal website and um, your Salesforce instance. So I'm not going to go ahead and uh, enter all this information, but I'll go ahead and show you the one that I have already created so that you can see what all the information looks like there. So when I click edit here, you would see uh, phone number, API, uh, contact email, um, all that. And under the available OAuth scopes, um, these are kind of the OAuth scopes you need to select if you want to perform like a full integration between Drupal and um, Salesforce. Um, so as you can see here, uh, the scopes that I've selected here are um, accessing and managing your data so that you can basically have data exchange between both full access in terms of so that you can basically write back information from Drupal to Salesforce. To, for example, if you pull um, information from Salesforce into Drupal and later on you decide, okay, I want to update this information within Drupal and have this updated information pushed back to Salesforce, uh, you would need the uh, full access. Uh, and then performing requests basically as this particular user and then access to the data via the web basically so that it can pull information back to. So these are kind of the uh, basic scopes you would kind of need if you want to have a full integration between your Drupal 8 instance and um, your Salesforce organization. And the callback URL uh, is basically whatever your site name is, uh, followed by Salesforce and then um, OAuth underscore callback. And I believe this basically, uh, you can see this URL in the back end when you're configuring the Salesforce uh, module after you have uh, installed it in Drupal 8. So once you um, have all this information and then save it, it will basically generate um, and the keys that are needed to establish the connection between Drupal and Salesforce. So as you can see here now, um, I have the consumer key and I have the consumer secret key. So these have been created by Salesforce after I have created this connected web app within Salesforce to establish the communication. So once you have the consumer key and the secret generated via the web app, um, you would go to the back end of Drupal. Um, so you would go to configuration, Salesforce and Salesforce authorization. And you'll see all these settings after obviously you enable the Salesforce modules uh, in the backend. So once you um, go to this configuration page, you would need to enter uh, the consumer key, the consumer secret that the Salesforce web app uh, connected app has generated, and then the URL for your Salesforce instance. So as you can see here, it's uh, my name dash dev dash ed dot my dot salesforce.com. And if I go here, you can see it's the same URL. So you would put in uh, your Salesforce organization URL there. And once you save that configuration, um, it will tell you that you have authorized uh, uh, access to basically all these different, um, let's call it data services to pull and push information with Salesforce and you'll also see that the callback URL uh, is this. So once you basically see this information, that means your Drupal website has successfully uh, established a connection uh, with your Salesforce um, instance. So once you have that uh, done, now starts the process of, okay, how do you configure uh, so that you can pull information and push information between Drupal and Salesforce. So I'm going to go ahead and go through a um, couple of examples um, here. Um, so to do that, uh, once you have enabled the Salesforce pull and the Salesforce push modules, you would see some additional options and configuration options under structure. So you would go to structure and then you will see a new uh, configure option, configuration option for the Salesforce mappings. So you would go to Salesforce mappings and I have already created a mapping here for uh, the account object in Salesforce. So like I had mentioned, account here basically like kind of correlates to a content type in Drupal. So account is a content type in a Salesforce standpoint and account will have 
um, many nodes uh, when we're talking in terms of Drupal terminology, but in Salesforce terminology, they're called records. So for me to look at all the accounts that are there in Salesforce, all I would do is, since I have already here all accounts selected, I would just say, click go. And that's when I'll kind of see all the accounts that are there in this um, sandbox a Salesforce organization. And as you can see, this looks similar to kind of the admin content listing page in Drupal where you're kind of seeing the node title uh, and then probably an alias. Or, and since all these fields are kind of empty for these records, nothing is populated here, but this is kind of like our admin content listing page within Drupal. And if I have to go to any of these records, I can just click that record. And once I go into that record, this again is kind of our Drupal node view page where you're seeing all the fields that are there in that particular content type for that particular um, node. You can see it has like account owner, name, parent account, uh, annual revenue, all these different fields that can be a text field, text area field, select field, or any different kind of field um, that you can think of basically when you create uh, a record. Um, so what I have done here is basically in the Salesforce mappings, what I tried to do in this already uh, existing mapping is I tried to map um, the account object um, the account object uh, in Salesforce to an account content type in Drupal. So for the case of this mapping, I basically created uh, an account content type in Drupal. Uh, let me go to that content type now. So structure, content types, account. And when I go to manage fields, all I have here is right now three different fields, account type, um, annual revenue, um, and then just a body field, which is there uh, out of the box. Um, so let me go to that mapping now here. So if you go back to the mapping here, um, I can see how this mapping has been done here. So when I click on the fields here, the way you would do mapping is just like the name itself. So you're trying to like point out, okay, this thing here is needs to be tagged to this particular thing. And then this and this here being uh, Drupal and Salesforce. So here, um, for the mapping, I can say here, um, the account name in Drupal, which is going to be the title in the Drupal, is mapping to the account name uh, itself in Salesforce. Same with the uh, other fields, so for example, annual revenue is a Drupal field that I have created, which is a text field. I'm having that mapped to the Salesforce field, which is annual revenue too. So for me to add a new mapping to a field um, against uh, a field in Salesforce, all I would do is basically I'll say um, add mapping. Um, sorry, go back here. So I would say field type um, to add a new field mapping for the already existing mapping. And if I say properties, um, so it will just give me a list of all the different fields that are available within Drupal. And in the second column, it will give me a list of all the different Salesforce fields that are available for that specific object, the object here being account. So whatever fields are available in the account object in Salesforce, you will see all these fields here. So you can select the source and the destination here. And in the third column, there's something called direction. So what this column is basically asking us to do is, it's asking us in which way or in which direction do you want the information to flow? Do you want the information to flow from Drupal to Salesforce, which means we're pushing information from Drupal back to Salesforce? Or do you want to just pull the information from Salesforce to Drupal, which means even though you make any changes to that particular record or node in Drupal, it will not get pushed back to Salesforce. Uh, the third option here being sync. Sync means it will make sure both Drupal and Salesforce are in sync at all time. Um, so for example, if somebody uh, updates a record in Salesforce, Drupal will automatically pull that whenever the cron runs. And if somebody updates that particular record in Drupal, it will get pushed to Salesforce again um, when that particular cron runs. So that's what uh, sync is for. According to your requirement, you would need to go with one, or, uh, one of these uh, options. And if you need to delete any mapping at any point, you would just um, select, uh, check that delete option, and then you will go ahead and delete that. Um, so like I mentioned, um, this is a mapping of the account content type in Drupal to, sorry, go ahead. What was the upsert key that was at the top of that field? That uh, It will basically uh, update and insert that if there is a uh, difference there between both of the both in Drupal and Salesforce instances. Um, so, uh, like I mentioned, this is a mapping between the Drupal uh, account content type to the account object in Salesforce. So, I'll try to go ahead and create a brand new mapping and see. Let's see how that goes. So, uh, for the sake of that, uh, since we have 
uh, something called opportunities here in Salesforce. Again, opportunities here is similar to a kind of type in Drupal. Here it's called object, and this is the opportunities object. In order to see all the opportunities that are there, I can just click go, and then I'll see all the opportunities again. This is again like the admin content listing page. So let me go ahead and create uh, an opportunity content type in Drupal. I'll just keep this to be as uh, minimum as possible so that I don't have to add a bunch of fields. Opportunity. Okay, now that I have the opportunity kind of type in Drupal, I'll try to go ahead and map it to the opportunity object in Salesforce. So I go to Salesforce, Salesforce mappings. I'll say I want to add a new mapping and I'll call it opportunity. And I want, uh, so it's asking, okay, what kind of a Drupal entity uh, are you trying to map to? Is it a taxonomy term? Is it a user? Or is it a content? And I'll say content here. And then content bundle being your content type, I'll say I want to map the opportunity. And in the next section, it's asking, okay, to which Salesforce object do you want to map this particular Drupal content type? And then here, I'll search for opportunity. Um, and then um, in the next section, it's asking us what are the, all the different action triggers uh, during which you want information to be exchanged. So do you want information to be exchanged when you create a Drupal uh, node for this opportunity, when you delete a Drupal node of this opportunity kind of type, uh, when a new opportunity is created in Salesforce, or when an opportunity is deleted in Salesforce. So it's asking what are all the different action triggers that you want to select. And here, let me go ahead and say, Salesforce and Drupal select all these options and then I'll just go ahead and um, save. Uh, the other settings are not quite important in terms of just establishing the communication and pulling and pushing information. So I'll go ahead and save. Now that I have established a mapping between the opportunity Drupal content type and the opportunity Salesforce object, I'm going to go ahead and add mappings for some fields here. So I'll say I want to map a property in Drupal and that property would be the title <coughs> and for the Salesforce <coughs> I want that to be mapped to the uh, let me go ahead and see what opportunities have here in Salesforce so there's opportunity name the name and I'll say I want that to be synced I'll go ahead and save now so if I go to so what we've done so far is basically we created a new mapping between the opportunity content type and the opportunity object in Salesforce and we have added a mapping for the title field to map it to the opportunity name in Salesforce so now if I go to content here and if I filter by the opportunity content type there are no nodes because nothing has been pulled or there's no nodes that have been created in Drupal but now if I go ahead and run cron you'll see that all opportunities have been uh, pulled from Salesforce. Um, so if I click edit, all you would see is just the title because that's the only field we have mapped between Drupal and Salesforce. So what I did is basically I went ahead and ran cron here, but there are a couple of crons that Salesforce modules uh, when we enable that provides us. So in order to see those individual cron jobs, I have ultimate cron enabled here on the site. So if I go to cron jobs now, let me go ahead and refresh this. So you will see that there are two crons, basically Salesforce pull and Salesforce push. So when I ran the cron, it went ahead and ran um, the Salesforce uh, pull cron, as you can see, it ran just like uh, less than a minute ago, and that's why it was able to pull all the opportunities that have been mapped. Um, now, to go ahead and uh, show you how data is kind of synced between Salesforce and Drupal, what I'll do is I'll just pick one um, organization that got pulled. So let me take this Grand Hotels Guest Portable Generators. I'll search for this exact same, uh, sorry, opportunity here in Salesforce. I found the opportunity. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and uh, edit the name within Salesforce of that particular. So what I'll do is I'll um, append Drupal GavCon at the beginning of that particular organization. Now, if I go back to the Drupal content, and if I go ahead and run the cron again, um, 
Um, while that gets pulled and updated, I'll show you a couple of things uh, in the back end too. So like I had shown you, when you enable the Salesforce pull and push cron, uh, sorry, push modules, you'll see these additional crons. Um, there's something called queue manager that you can also enable. So when you go to, when you enable that module, you would go to configuration system and queue manager. That's where you can kind of see, let's say you're uh, pulling 100,000 uh, different records from Salesforce Drupal and you kind of want to see, okay, what is the st status of that particular pull job? Is that even getting pulled? Is, are there any errors? You can go to this queue manager and if there are things that are in the Salesforce pull queue that are yet to be pulled and updated in Drupal, you can see that here. You can see the number of items that are kind of waiting in the queue to be updated by Drupal. And when you click inspect, you can basically see uh, a list of all the different uh, objects that are in the queue, uh, that are in the queue that are to be pulled um, into Drupal from Salesforce. So I think go back here. Okay, so just I was, as, as you would imagine while doing a presentation, things sometimes don't work. Mm -hmm. That did not work, but. When you changed it, it looked like you got a little red messy. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that was because uh, it said you have made a change, but you haven't saved that yet. So I think you're talking about, let's say I do that, that message, right? Yeah. So it's basically just saying, okay, you've kind of updated, but haven't saved the record yet. So let me try that one more time. Okay, I'll try to get to that later and see why it's not uh, updating, but as you can see, uh, the communication has been established and op all opportunities uh, were getting um, pulled uh, from Salesforce into um, uh, Drupal. Uh, you can do the same thing uh, the other uh, direction too. For example, you can make updates within sales, uh, within the Drupal uh, and then make sure they're getting uh, pushed to sales, uh, Salesforce too. So one example I have here for that is, um, so I'll go uh, back to an already existing mapping that I have for an already existing content type here, um, the account uh, content type. And um, here, uh, for this particular uh, Drupal node, which has information pulled from Salesforce already, I'll try to go ahead and see uh, if the push works. So I, let me go ahead and pull that uh, associated record within Salesforce so that we can see what value it has right now. So it basically has the annual revenue for this accidency bulk company in Salesforce is $250,000. So what I'll do is, uh, I'll go to that here and I'll say it's 750. And I'll go ahead and save. So let me try to run the cron. Let me make sure the cron has run. And it has run uh, a minute ago. So let's see if this worked. So as you can see, the push cron worked and it has updated the value from Drupal uh, to Salesforce. So we had changed the value in Drupal from $250,000 to $750 and it got updated to Salesforce too. So that's how you kind of establish uh, the mappings between Drupal and Salesforce and that's how you uh, kind of pull and push information. And then uh, it can be on a field by field basis too. For example, in a particular mapping in a content type, you can choose to like push only certain fields back to Salesforce and you can decide, okay, I want to pull these fields only. I did not want to push all the fields. So um, that's how you would uh, map it. And um, and sometimes uh, there are uh, places where you are wondering, okay, how do I go ahead and see all the fields that are in this particular Salesforce object? I mean, just looking at this, I see there are so many fields. There are like 20 or 30 fields. And you're trying to figure out, okay, what is their, uh, let's call it API name. If you're trying to write custom code uh, to pull information for whatever reason from Salesforce into Drupal, um, uh, the Salesforce suite module supports a um, lot of brush commands within which you can perform so many operations for interactions between Drupal and Salesforce. And one uh, cool and um, useful command is uh, brush Salesforce read object and the short code kind of for that is SFRO. For example, if I were to see, if I were wondering, okay, what are all the different fields that are in this accident bulk company in Salesforce, what I would do is I would take the ID, so this is kind of like our um, node ID in Drupal, Salesforce has this ID, so this is how it identifies that particular record in Salesforce. I can basically just take that, um, and if you are uh, if you have Drush enabled on your Drupal site, you would just go to wherever your Drupal installation is, and if you just, uh, uh, looks 
like when the Wi-Fi dropped in, Fiona lost my connection to my server. Uh, I'll try to get that to that in a bit. But when you do the Drush SFRO followed by this particular Salesforce ID, it will show you all the different API names for all the different uh, fields um, that are um, in Salesforce. <coughs> Any questions so far? Is there a quota? What's that? Quota on the number of times you can ping Salesforce? Yes, uh, depending upon the Salesforce, uh, as you might know, basically operates in terms of licenses, basically. So for this Salesforce cloud, um, depending on the R, uh, license that your particular organization has, uh, it, there is a cap on the number of API calls that can be made within a 24-hour time period, and it resets um, every 24 hours, basically. And some of the ones that I have worked with uh, has a cap of 45,000 API calls. Uh, when I say API calls, for example, when we pulled all the opportunities here, when we did the opportunity mapping from Salesforce to Drupal, um, let's see how many items it got pulled for opportunities. Uh, be it 100,000, be it 50,000, it considers it as just one API call, basically. Since you're trying to pull all the records from one object, it's just one API call. So unless you have some kind of a bug in your code or any custom code that you have written, you will kind of never um, hit that API limit um, unless you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of objects and writing custom code and trying to um, get a record from every other object every other minute, you wouldn't hit that. But again, it completely depends on the license uh, that you have for your particular Salesforce organization. And, uh, can you trigger like the, I don't know, I'm not too familiar with Salesforce, mm -hmm. but I know that sort of workflow mm -hmm. changes. Mm -hmm. If you change a property in the content in Drupal that drives you know, interested or you know, registered or some other property change, would you just kick off the workflow in Salesforce? They're like an event hook or something on the other end of Salesforce. Experience. Within Salesforce, yes, you can create all these uh, events. Basically, you can say when a record has been changed, trigger this. Yes, in Salesforce, you can create all these different workflows. Basically, um, just like in Drupal, you can create, uh, let's say, uh, for example, workbench moderation. When a particular somebody um, creates a Drupal node and changes it from, let's say, draft to needs review state, and you can have uh, an email triggered to your publisher saying, hey, somebody has created a new Drupal node. Could you please review that? You can have similar email triggers and all different kinds of um, other triggers too within Salesforce. You can auto update other fields, you can auto update other records, uh, have dependencies between different objects and different records. Yes, all those can be created within Salesforce. If you have, if Drupal has trouble sending an update to Salesforce to save a number of problem at the time, mm -hmm. will it queue? Uh, yes. It will all be uh, stored in the queue, and you can always go back and inspect the queue and then see when was the last time it pushed and what item got stuck. And then once you figure out what has caused the issue and once it's fixed, if you rerun that particular cron process, it will go ahead and push that update back to Salesforce. How long will it, will it keep things up indefinitely? Does it flush the queue? No, it wouldn't flush it unless you manually clear, uh, clear that queue. Okay. And then uh, within the map, so just to address that question again, so for example, if for whatever reason, if you decide, okay, I think some of my records within Drupal are corrupted or somebody made some changes and you need to figure out what you can do is, uh, within the mappings itself, so if I go to Salesforce, um, Salesforce mappings, uh, and if I go to properties here, you can basically reset the last full date because the way this works is, um, the Salesforce suite module stores a timestamp of when was the last time it pulled records of a particular uh, mapping or an object. And it will look at Salesforce again and see, okay, all these different records have been updated in Salesforce since the last time I did a pull on Drupal. So that's how it keeps off kind of uh, a track of what has changed and what needs to be pulled. So for some reason, if you think something is corrupted in your Drupal <coughs> instance, and if you need to pull or re-pull all the records for that particular object, you can basically just say reset last pull date for that particular mapping, and once you run the cron again, it's just going to refetch all the um, records from Salesforce into Drupal for that particular object. Um, what about the conflicts? Right? If someone actually updated something in Salesforce and someone else updated something in Drupal, the cron runs only, they say, at the end of the day, if there is a discrepancy, like what happens, like which one gets updated? Um, so whichever runs first, that will get updated first. So for example, if a Salesforce, uh, uh, sorry, if Drupal basically the cron runs and somebody updated that record in Drupal, uh, it will go ahead and override that uh, within Salesforce basically. So cron pushes first or pulls first? Uh, it depends on how you set it basically. 
So you can have different intervals. So for example, um, you can set push cron to run every 10 minutes, whereas you can set pull cron to run um, every 15 minutes. So it depends on how you kind of set those two up. How does a field level validation handle it? What happens if there are different validation settings on the Salesforce side, on the Google side, like a text field? Um, you will see an error uh, in the queue manager that it was not able to push that. And when you inspect that, um, you'll see that in the log, that particular item. And Salesforce is pretty good, at least from my experience, in terms of the mappings and configurations I've done. Um, it does clearly have a verbose log where it says expecting data in this format, but you are trying to push in this particular format. Also, when it tries to push and it fails, it will give you um, exactly a list of all the fields that you tried to push and all the values you tried to push for those corresponding values. So you can kind of correlate that error log message with what is getting pushed and kind of uh, resolve that particular issue. But there's not a way to, for example, create a date field in Drupal that's based on the same validation settings of that date field in Salesforce? Uh, you can. So if Salesforce is expecting date in a specific format, and if you set the field uh, to accept the date value in that specific mm -hmm. format within Drupal, it will go ahead and um, agree with those mappings, and it will go ahead and push that. So it's not going to do that automatically if I just wanted to match the uh, No, it won't do that automatically because Drupal, uh, the date field, the however you set it up, it will try to push that date value in exactly that format. It won't like try to figure out, okay, Salesforce is expecting the date in this format, so I'll go ahead and convert the date mm -hmm. into that acceptable format and push it. It won't do that. So you'll have to kind of um, see what kind of options are available there and what kind of formats it's expecting and try to push that in that specific format. Sure. Any other questions so far? Okay. So let me go ahead and see if the change that I made is kind of reflected now for that particular opportunity. Okay, it did not get reflected. So I'm not sure why it did not get pushed, but as you could see, we were able to pull. That means something uh, was wrong with that particular record, I believe. And again, um, it also depends on what kind of permissions your particular uh, user has within Salesforce too. So basically, you could say in the connected web app that we created in the beginning to establish communication between Drupal and Salesforce, you could say, okay, this user cannot make any updates to this particular field or to this particular object. So you can go granular at a field level to within Salesforce. So you can say, nobody can actually overwrite this annual revenue value. So even though Drupal tries to push it, um, it won't basically update it in Salesforce. So you can have um, field level uh, restrictions there within Salesforce too, and object level restrictions also so that somebody does not try to push an update a value that they are not supposed to push. Okay. Is there a mapping of users between Drupal and Salesforce? Yes, you can go ahead and do the user mapping too. You can go ahead and do um, content mapping. Um, yes, so if I go back to the mapping structure or Salesforce. In terms of the permission system and you know, the users who log into Drupal. Uh, so you're talking about single sign-on? Between well, I, I guess. Um, I mean, well, what user is the effective user in Salesforce when you're editing content in Drupal? Mm -hmm. You know, and use part is is there really? Is that, is that even an issue? I mean, so when I when I meant yes, you can pull users. I meant in terms of let's say there are um, um, let's say there is um, an object. For example, all these accounts are kind of let's say people here, right? So if I go. Um, so for these companies, if you think they are like kind of users within Salesforce, you can do a mapping for these particular uh, records of the account object to the users within Drupal so they'll get pulled. That doesn't mean they can actually log in per se, it's just that you're trying to pull all their information here. Uh, so one pretty good use case where we um, have done this mapping is basically we have worked with clients who use obviously Salesforce, um, Sales Cloud as their CRM. They basically have um, all their students uh, within Salesforce, what are what courses are they studying, what grades they got, um, all their profile details within Salesforce. So what we have kind of done is basically um, we had single sign-on with a different third-party provider they have, but all their student information was within Salesforce. Mm -hmm. So once we did all this mapping, what the students would do is they would just log into the website using that SSO, and once they log in, basically we have a communication established between the Drupal website and the Salesforce organization. So they can go to their profile and see all the information that they have in Salesforce for their profile within Drupal. They can update um, the courses they've taken, they can update their dietary restrictions, they can update their address, and all that information is kind of getting pushed back to Salesforce. So Salesforce was kind of the primary source of all the student data, but the student is never directly interacting with Salesforce. I think um, that's kind of the whole point when you try to integrate websites um, with the different uh, 
AMSs or other um, CRMs basically because you don't want kind of your users to interact uh, with these uh, CRMs or AMSs because they're not kind of user friendly in terms of the front end or they're not prettier to look or interact with basically. So and students or anybody, any users basically, they're on your website all the time if they have a profile. So you're not having the user switch between two different platforms having them go to the website to do some things versus going back to Salesforce to do some other things. You're kind of having or creating a seamless experience uh, for the user to like interact in just one place whereas all the information is being stored somewhere else, uh, in this case being Salesforce. Following up on that, when Drupal triggers changes in Salesforce, mm -hmm. do they show up in the, in the Salesforce audit trail as being done by yes. Yes. one specific user for that OAuth? Yes. Uh, I'm not you make it look like it came from you know, staff member Alice. Uh, yes, I don't think I have it enabled here, but when you are on a particular record, uh, when you scroll to the bottom, and if that log is enabled, it will, I don't think I have it enabled here, uh, but if you look at that log, it will say that um, the Drupal integration, because that's the connected web app name that I created, has updated the annual revenue from X to Y, basically. So you'll go ahead and see everything here um, below under the log, it will show you exactly who changed and what. And that also, you can configure that in the sense show me a log message only when these fields are changed because some of the fields you may or may not uh, uh, worry about even if they are changed but some you definitely want to see if they get uh, if they got updated and by whom for example if annual revenue is one of the fields you can go ahead and configure in salesforce um, in a way that in the log it will show that the annual revenue has been updated for this record by the drupal integration user from two hundred fifty thousand dollars to seven hundred fifty thousand dollars yes there is a trail of um, seeing when it got changed and what got changed. But there's no way for me to make that show that this got changed by Drupal via who Drupal says was staff member Alice versus staff member Bob, right? It's just going to say it was changed by Drupal. Yes, it will say, uh, it will give you the name of the connected web app that you have created, in this case being Drupal integration, the very first uh, so connected app. For all those exactly, things. because it's that particular user right. Uh, that Drupal sees as uh, interacting with the Salesforce and Salesforce only knows that there is something called Drupal integration which is a connected app that is kind of authenticated with Drupal and that is kind of uh, acting as the go-to between communication between and Drupal and uh, um, Salesforce. So I'm not sure if there is a way to specifically show in the log message which Drupal user updated it. Uh, I'm curious to find out myself if there is a way to do that. And all of this works via proxy. Yes. So yes. Uh, real so, time when an is updated. Yes. So uh, whenever you run the cron here, so I've been running it uh, from here because so that I don't have to come here and run the individual crons. But you can go ahead and run the individual crons here, and that's when uh, it will basically. So if I go ahead and say, I will run Salesforce pull cron, and I can always look at the logs too and see when it was triggered by whom and at what time. So if I go to the Salesforce pull, and if I look at the logs here. Uh, it will say launched manually and then launched in thread is basically the automatic cron that is running every 15 minutes that has been set up. So yes, everything is running by cron. And like I had mentioned, you can always go back to your uh, queue manager here and look at the queue because sometimes, as you can see here, it says there are two items here in the queue. And if I click inspect, uh, it says the item ID, when it's going to expire, when it got created, and if I click view, um, this was what I was talking about before when there's an error between the uh, communication between Drupal and Salesforce, you'll see something similar to this basically it's saying um, um, in this particular Drupal object that is mapped to Salesforce, these are all the different values and that's what is, that is the information that it's getting pulled to. And you can see, kind of see this log uh, when you are on the individual Drupal node. For example, if I go back here, there is a Salesforce tab that gets added here when you establish the connection, when you have all this integration. And when you click on Salesforce, you kind of see um, the Salesforce record ID, what the entity name is, and what the mapping is, and then you can just click view, and that's when you'll see basically uh, what the record is. And to directly go to that particular record in Salesforce, there's an easy link. You can just click on this. It will automatically take you to that particular um, record within Salesforce. Yep. So what happens when parties start to see the event where the same content is edited both on the Drupal side of things and on the Salesforce? sites um, of things, how does the sync happen? So like I had mentioned before, so whichever cron runs first, that will kind of take over and that will update accordingly. So let's say uh, you update um, a Drupal node um, and at the same time somebody else is updating um, the same record in Salesforce. Depends on when Salesforce 
push or Salesforce pull cron is running in Drupal, whichever runs first, that will kind of take over basically. So if you update it in Drupal first and then Salesforce pull cron runs, uh, sorry, push cron runs that, runs that very next minute, it's going to go ahead and update that uh, within Salesforce. So you kind of have to like um, work with whoever is managing your Salesforce instance on when the records are being updated and when they need to get pulled. And accordingly, you can create processes back in um, Salesforce too. And um, usually Salesforce administrators kind of keep a watch and then have uh, workflow emails on their end too to make sure what's getting updated at what time so that they are always aware of that. Like I mentioned, we don't want somebody updating the same record in two different places at the same time, one overwriting the other and at the same time uh, you wouldn't know which one's right or which one's the most up-to-date value. I think your cron run more frequently would probably help with that, wouldn't it? Yes, but also it depends on how you have it set up. If you run the cron more frequently, that means it increases the number of API calls you're making. To. So if you're trying to run the Salesforce pull and push cron every minute, and if you have thousands of records being pushed and being pulled from all different types of uh, objects and content names, that means there is a um, a chance uh, you might uh, hit the API limit and also there's a link uh, using which you can basically um, um, see the number of API calls you had um, uh, made within a 24 time frame. Um, I can post that link um, on the session page on the Drupal GovCon site below in the comments. Um, all you would need to do in that particular link is uh, update, uh, let me see if I can pull that here. So, so everything up front is your Salesforce org, and everything after is kind of constant in terms of uh, what the link is. So I'll go ahead and post this um, on the session page on the Drupal GovCon site. So whenever you have your own Salesforce uh, sandbox organization created, all you would need to do is you can just copy paste this link and replace the front uh, domain part of that um, with your URL. And as you can see here, this kind of gives you um, a record of the number of API calls being made um, within the last week. Uh, and then as I had said, um, this resets every uh, 24 hours. So whatever API calls you make in 24 hours, uh, if you're hitting, let's say, you have a limit of 45,000 API calls in 24 hours, and if that's going to end at 2 p.m. today, and if you have already hit 44,000, uh, then there is a chance you might hit the 1,000 in the next uh, 15 minutes to one hour. Uh, so if you are coming to that situation, uh, I would say go ahead and disable your Salesforce pull and push runs. They'll just get added to the queue. They won't just get processed, basically. Um, or else try to increase your um, license load so that you have uh, more uh, API calls within 24 hour time frame. Any other questions? And then um, any features that basically Salesforce, you're not able to get out of um, the Salesforce suite of modules, it's that if you had to need to write any kind of custom code to perform anything um, additional. Uh, their API is very good, so you can basically go ahead and write, for example, if you want to write a custom uh, query there called SoQL query Salesforce object query language. So you can write your own custom queries and then query specific objects and specific records to be pulled and at what time. So you can go ahead and create uh, custom code to there. Uh, if you look at the Salesforce suite of modules itself, they have very good hooks that you can basically go ahead and customize. Yeah, question? Well, I was just wondering if, if there was a use case in which you wanted real time pushing into Salesforce, just based on your sense as a developer, how difficult would that be to run like an entity save so that it's running that every time with Drupal object to save rather than having to wait to, to run a cron you know, every five minutes? Uh, it is pretty easy. You can just go ahead and do that, and you can even limit that for a specific object if you need to. Because you do, I'm not sure if you want to do that mapping for every, uh, if you want to do real time sync for every object mapping within Drupal. So you can go ahead and customize just that piece too, and then try to push only those particular mapping objects um, in real time. Uh, any other questions? Let me make sure I covered everything that I would like to. Um, also, when I had initially asked how many of you are using Salesforce, it looked like not many people raised your hands. So I'm assuming you're kind of all new to Salesforce. So I've been showing kind of the Salesforce, let's call it the back end here, uh, in context of Drupal where I had said Drupal content types kind of related to Salesforce objects and Drupal nodes kind of related to Salesforce records. 
but for you to like kind of practice play with all this um, Salesforce has a very cool um, uh, let's call it uh, a website um, it's called trailhead have you ever has anybody ever heard of trailhead um, so trailhead is a place where you can basically go ahead create an account log in and teach yourself all different things that you could do in Salesforce so let me go ahead and pull that up so trailhead.salesforce.com um, so this has basically different trails um, in the sense if you are uh, trying to learn what Salesforce is what you can do in Salesforce you can pick just that particular trail here or you can just pick that particular module if you want to or you can pick just that particular project that has to do with what you're trying to learn and then go through that sequence of steps the way this works is basically you will kind of walk through um, a series of um, reading material let's say so you would go ahead and read that for example I'm in this business value of um, equality this is a common um, thing it, does, it has nothing to do with Salesforce per se but you will see uh, different trails for Salesforce too so it kind of tells you okay this particular reading unit has uh, you would need uh, 10 minutes to read this 25 minutes to read this 10 minutes to read this so like this you can basically go through and read everything that you would like to learn uh, about Salesforce be it Salesforce beginner advanced level intermediate level if you are trying to like uh, write custom code within Salesforce or if you're trying to do mappings or if you're trying to do data migration with Salesforce or if you're trying to do a migration from some other platform to Salesforce you can kind of learn yourself by going through all these tutorials and over the course of learning you'll kind of earn badges uh, in Salesforce and that's kind of um, and that is how you kind of like try to keep yourself motivated on trying to okay I would like to get 50 badges I'd like to get 500 badges so they kind of gamify it so that you can go to the profile um, so I can show you since I've done this I'll just log in here and show you how it is so this is if you are trying to learn Salesforce and trying to probably propose a Salesforce for the organization you are working for to use Salesforce as a CMS um, not a CMS sorry uh, as a CRM so if I go to uh, my profile here so this is how you would see your profile too when you basically go ahead and uh, try to go through all these different exercises um, so for example even if you are trying to learn what an API is has nothing to do with Salesforce but general knowledge in terms of programming um, Salesforce has uh, an API basics task so you can basically learn how to use the REST API how to use the SOAP API how to use bulk how to use streaming API and after each and every reading unit you basically kind of have a quiz at the bottom or an exercise uh, when I say quiz it's basically multiple choice questions or uh, when I say exercise it's basically you trying to um, launch uh, a sandbox Salesforce environment and do everything that that particular um, uh, learning unit has asked you to do so it will probably ask you to go ahead and create a new object it will probably ask you to go ahead and add new fields it will probably ask you to go ahead and add validation to fields so you can learn all that um, both from a Salesforce standpoint or else general programming standpoint too. so uh, this is very uh, good and useful so that you can like self teach yourself on various things that you can do in Salesforce and uh, outside Salesforce too so I highly recommend going to the Salesforce trailhead and creating uh, an account so that you can basically walk to them uh, um, it, it lasts forever and so a developer account is separate uh, yes trailhead account is where you would just go through all these reading material and then try out different things but during the process of learning itself you will have an option to create uh, a sandbox you can have multiple sandboxes uh, so for example if I go to my profile sorry settings uh, you can see I have like one two three six almost seven different uh, sandbox environments so based on the reading task you are working on and based on the assignment that you're doing for that particular reading task it will allow you to create uh, a Salesforce sandbox environment on the fly right there so it will just go ahead and create one for you and whenever um, you go through that particular exercise it kind of automatically validates you if you have passed that particular exercise or not for example if it says go ahead and create a new employee object in Salesforce go ahead and add employee name employee location employee address all these fields to that particular object and when you say okay I've done all this and click submit it will kind of validate everything and make sure you've done everything that you were supposed to do and it will give you the points accordingly so and that based on the number of points you come up with and based on the number of trails you complete you kind of move from one level to the other uh, within Salesforce trailhead too and there are like hundreds of trails hundreds of modules like I said it's not everything is Salesforce specific within trailhead like I've shown you there was API basics 
Um, there are some basic things that any programmer would want to know or any site builder would, not, would want to know uh, from a Salesforce standpoint that are there here. So you have everything from beginner, intermediate, advanced level, and you can, uh, you can also filter by uh, the level um, based on your Salesforce role. Let's say, are you uh, a Salesforce administrator in your organization or are you a Salesforce developer in your organization? So accordingly, you can choose your role uh, and also all the different products that Salesforce um, offers. And this is free, anybody can just go ahead and create an account and then start going through these, let's call it badges slash exercise and trying to learn um, things that have to do with Salesforce and things that have nothing to do with Salesforce too. Um, again, as I keep scrolling, you can see Google Analytics Basics. So for example, if you have a new intern in your organization, if you're trying to like let them learn what Google Analytics is, you just go ahead and point them here and say, hey, go through this exercise and then learn and then try to answer the questions and that's how you kind of learn about Google Analytics. So, Any other Drupal Salesforce integration questions? I, I have a question. Sure. Um, have you heard of Formstack by any chance? Formstack for creating online forms? Yes. It, it, have you done a Formstack slash Drupal slash Salesforce integration before, where it would input information into a form stack set up on Drupal and it would push that information into Salesforce. Not exactly with form stack though. I, have, I don't think I did exactly a form stack integration. Uh, but me, And you have already looked and you couldn't find a way to do that? Well, it's not that. It's just that that is something that we're looking into. And Got it. myself, I am actually the Salesforce admin for my organization. Okay. And I do not know that much about Drupal. We're looking into integrating the both of them and using Formstack for various forms, such as for volunteering, get involved, mm -hmm. as well as um, uh, just you know, um, inputting that from, from so form format. One thing I have definitely done is yeah. uh, integrating Drupal web forms with Salesforce, basically. Okay. So instead of using Formstack itself, you can create the web forms in Drupal itself, and then have all the submissions within Drupal web form right to a particular object in Salesforce. For example, what you could do is you can create, in this particular example, you can create a volunteer submission web form in Drupal, collect all the information you need to, create a corresponding object within Salesforce, let's call it volunteers, right? And then you would create all the corresponding fields. So if you're collecting volunteer name, volunteer age, volunteer address, volunteer email address, create corresponding fields for that in Salesforce, volunteer name, volunteer address, volunteer email address, and then you would do the exact same thing that you have done kind of here. You would, the only difference would be here, you're trying to map kind of a Drupal content type to a Salesforce object there, you would kind of map the Drupal web form mm -hmm. uh, to Salesforce. So here we're kind of trying to eliminate form stack. Okay. You're just uh, doing a direct uh, integration between Drupal and um, Salesforce. Which would be more efficient. It would be more seamless so that you, you don't have to like maintain other, another system uh, in between. So I've done uh, web form uh, uh, submission integration between Drupal and um, Salesforce. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay, no more questions, I think that is it.